anthropologists who study religion are often in a really interesting position. Here we are, a social science that attempts to understand other cultures. But what do you do when you encounter religious beliefs, myths, and ideologies that are irrational? Hey, and welcome to another edition of Anthropology in 10 or Less. I'm your host, Michael Kilman, and real quick, don't forget to support this page with a like and a subscribe. And also, you can head over to Patreon or check out some of my published works. Today, we're going to look at another entry in the Anthropology of Religion by looking at the limitations of rationalism, and why, in this episode, I will argue that we should suspend both belief and disbelief in the episodes ahead in order to better understand the spiritual life of other people we study. We'll start today with a wonderful book on the anthropology of religion called Beyond Rationalism, Rethinking Witchcraft, Magic, and Sorcery. Here in the West, we like to think of rationalism as a point of departure for all scientific inquiry and study. But what if using that as a starting point actually prevents us from understanding what's happening in a culture? The reason I focus on this topic now is because, well, the fact is, future episodes on religion are going to get into the quote, weird stuff. Shamans, mystics, magic possession, and all the other stuff that can seem bizarre to us. Or if you're really into rationalism, it can seem like outright quackery. We have to remember that the concept of rationalism comes from a very specific part of European history and a series of causes and conditions. Remember those three C's we talked about? These conditions led to a particular point of analysis. But rationalism isn't a natural or inevitable outcome for a culture. It's an element of culture. If it was natural and inevitable, then every culture would just stumble upon it. But certainly not all do. Now, I know some of you out there might groan at this idea, but why would rationalism naturally arise in the human experience? It's not a product of nature. It's a product of long-standing cultural systems. That doesn't mean that if science and knowledge were destroyed tomorrow, that it wouldn't come back someday. Odds are that it very much would, because science is a process whereby we search for the truth based in large part on observation and testing. But that doesn't mean that approaching everything with rationalism is the right tool to use in all circumstances. Think of it like this, you're not going to use a hammer to cut down a tree. In the chapter Outside All Reason and the edited volume Beyond Rationalism, anthropologist Bruce Kapifer offers this idea. Certainly, the phenomenon of magic and sorcery have much bearing on reason and rationality, but their potential is much greater when released from the prison of reason. Evans Pritchard's path-breaking work suggests as much. In his pages, magic and sorcery reveal qualities of the human imaginary in dream and in daily waking practice. These, in their specifics, broach serious questions as to the role of the imaginary or imaginal in the construction of realities and in the intuitive orientation of human beings to the process of their ongoing existence. Basically, if we want to understand our fellow humans who are different from us, we have to try to understand their imaginations. How or why do they understand dreams? How and why do they understand magic, spiritual experiences, possession, mental health, emotions? Things outside and inside the bounds of everyday life? In other words, Kapifer isn't arguing that rationalism is bad, quite the contrary. But he is arguing that it's a particular approach from a European culture, and that if we use this as our starting point, we will very likely fail to understand the diverse spiritual experience for different traditions. Now, quick note here, I posted a link to a documentary on Evans Pritchard's work with the Azandi below in the info section of this video. It's an older ethnographic film, but I still think it's worth watching to understand the completely different system of non-Western logic and rationalism. After all, what one culture thinks is rational isn't always rational in the eyes of another culture. We often play this game, don't we? My culture is more reasonable and logical than yours. Kapifer further states, magical practices are not merely the plane for the demonstration of sociological or psychological theory, a folk instance of what we already know, but for want of a better description, they display a machinery of their own. He's saying that by letting go of limitations of Western rationalism, we have a better chance to understand the social and cultural processes behind the culture's spiritual life. In other words, if we really want to step into the shoes of the people we are studying, we have to try our best to think like they do, even if it's completely foreign and different to our own experience. That's just basic participant observation, all the way back from episode one. 
And this falls in line with a long debate over emic, an insider approach to research, versus edic, an outsider approach to research. The emic focuses on utilizing knowledge from an insider cultural perspective, someone who knows the culture from within, whereas the edic is the more fly-on-the-wall, outside-observer approach. I always remember this as edic, outside, because they both have T's. Maybe that will help you. These days, though, anthropologists usually do a blend of both, recognizing the merit in each approach to gain a better picture of what's happening on the ground. So Kapifer is essentially saying that rationalism is an outsider approach to research and that we will miss dimensions of the cultural experience if we aren't careful. And since the point of anthropology is to understand other people, differences in cultures, then we have to let go of some of our own preconceptions. Now I want to pause for a moment here to recognize that there is a debate on how much we should be involved in anthropology, and a number of scholars caution that getting too close to a culture, specifically in religion, could prevent us from seeing things from a social scientific standpoint because we will become biased as a result of our personal involvement in the practice. Others, however, talk about something called radical participation. In her article, Anthropology, Shamanism, and Alternative Ways of Knowing Being in the World, Bonnie Glass Coffin, yes, that's her real name, and yes, it is exactly perfect for an anthropologist studying religion, she describes radical participation after 20 years of studying shamanism. She argues that, quote, because ethnographers have begun embracing the value of stepping outside themselves and being changed by the process, the tired assertion that anthropology cannot be a good science unless the participant observers remain detached from their cognitive and spiritual worldviews of their informants can no longer be accepted at face value. She further states later in that quote that a methodological perspective that emphasizes inner subjectivity, engagement, vulnerability, willingness to news control, and the ethnographer's willingness to be transformed by spiritual and cognitive maps different from her own is more ethically defensible in decolonizing than detachment typical of participant observation. Essentially, she is also arguing that rationalism and distance prevent a deeper understanding of the cultural processes that surround the spiritual life of a culture. Detachment and disinterest as a point of analysis are essentially going to limit your ability to really understand a powerful and transformative element of the culture that you're studying. Now, you may disagree with this, and of course, some other anthropologists certainly do, but my viewpoints integrate belief, considering the following example. If you decided that you wanted to understand the culture of American ghost hunting, and you kept the belief of the ghost hunter at a distance, could you ever really understand them? Or would your analysis be more likely to be patronizing and dismissive? Remember, we're trying to understand the culture, not decide if it's good or bad, right or wrong. We aren't concerned with fact or fiction here, but the process of culture. Whether a ghost is real or not is beyond the point of our question. We're trying to understand what the culture is doing. And so much of what people do is in part how they believe the world works. Anthropology is about studying humans, and a rational or logical side of a human is only one mode or method for moving through the world. Glass Coffin later states, to simply dismiss unseen worlds as not empirically defensible strips the assertion of the authority from the researcher. Experiential anthropology, however, challenges ethnographers to think beyond our taken-for-granted notions of the real. Of course, any anthropologist will be wise to weigh the pros and cons of each approach and see what works best in each situation. We often say in anthropology, because of the complexity of humans and cultures, there's no easy, one-size-fits-all approach or solutions to really anything. So in the episodes ahead on religion, do your best to keep an open mind and remember the limitations of rationalism and understanding something. As I always like to say to my students, you don't have to like it, but you should try to understand it. Well, that's all for this episode of Anthropology in 10 or Less. Feel free to check out my books or my website, LeridiansLaboratory.com, where you can find all kinds of free resources on anthropology, world building, or various other ways of knowing and thinking about the world. Special thanks to our wonderful Patreon supporters and those who recently donated to the show. We couldn't do this without you, and we'll see you next time.